Hello everyone and welcome to the next lecture on ecological interactions. Um, previously when we talked about evolution, most of the time we talked about populations of a single species that were in isolation, but in reality populations of one species rarely if ever are isolated from other populations of other species. Um, in most cases they share a habitat and the interactions between them will play a major role in regulating their population growth and abundance. And so we call these communities, and what is a community? Well, an ecological community consists of all of the populations of all the different species that live together in a particular area. Um, and when we look at the interactions between different species in a community, we call those interspecific interactions because inter means between, so the interactions between other populations in a community. Um, we'll look at a few different types, but they have different effects on the two participants that are uh, participating in the interaction. So they can be positive, which will denote with a plus sign. They can be negative, which will denote with a negative sign or a minus sign. And they could be neutral, and if so, we'll use a, a zero. So um, the main types that we'll look at today will be competition, which is a negative-negative interaction, predation, which is positive for one and negative for the other, mutualism, which is a double positive, commensalism, which I'll argue does not actually exist, but is in theory a po positive and neutral interaction, and parasitism, which is a positive and a negative interaction. So when we look at something like a coral reef, um, we, we'd have to look at, if we were an ecological, uh, a community ecologist, uh, I should say, um, if we were to look at all of the different species on this coral reef, we'd start with all the different types of fish, um, all the different species of fish, um, and how they interact with each other, and how they interact with the corals, and how the zooxanthellae, which are the tiny microscopic uh, photosynthetic algae that live within the um, corals, how they interact with the corals and how they interact with the fish. And so you can see that there are a lot of organisms and the crustaceans that live on here, a lot of organisms that live on a coral reef. And um, it's never just one, popula one population living in isolation. So here are, here's just a quick uh, summary of what we're going to go over today. Um, we'll go over them in, in definitional form, and I'll show you one example of each. But then on Friday, when uh, I make the next lecture, we'll sort of go more in depth and talk about a whole bunch of different examples of it, and I think it'll be really fun. So um, we'll start with competition, we'll go into predation, we'll go into herbivory, um, mutualism, commensalism, parasitism, and something called parasitoidism. So let's get started. So the first one I want to talk about is competition. Um, in interspecific competition, it's we're talking about competition between members of two different species that use the same limited resource and therefore compete for it. But in intraspecific competition, members of the same species use the same limited resource and therefore they compete for it. And so those resources can be mates, those resources can be food, water, shelter, and so anything that is necessary to survive, organisms either within the same species or within two different species will compete for it. And so depending on what the species are, or if we're looking at the same species, we're either talking about interspecific competition or intraspecific competition. Um, competition negatively affects both participants, so we call it a minus-minus interaction. Um, either species would have a higher survival and reproduction if the other was absent. Now you might say, well, one of them wins, so surely that's a positive, and that's true. One of them does win in the end. However, they often use so much, so much resources in order to get that win that it's still much worse than it would be if they didn't have to compete for it. Um, so we say species compete when they have what are called overlapping niches, and a niche is basically an organism's ecological job or its ecological role. Um, competition can be minimized if two species that have overlapping niches evolve by natural selection to utilize less similar resources, and 
That is called resource partitioning, where an organism evolves to use less similar resources. And so um, this is really why we see uh, we see evolution in, in the you know happen the way that it does is because if two organisms share the exact same ecological niche, the competition increases and increases until that selection uh, is selected again. So that's competition. Um, here's just an example of uh, some intra-specific competition. This uh, might be two male leopards that are fighting for territory or mates, and you can see that they one of them is going to come out on top here, but it won't be for lack of trying from the other. And so um, it's a really interesting uh, look at how these organisms interact with each other. Okay, so let's talk about predation. Um, in predation, a member of one species, which is the predator, eats part or all of the living or recently living body of another organism, which is the prey. The interaction is beneficial for the predator, but harmful for the prey, so we call it a plus minus interaction. Now, if you're walking outside and you step on a spider, uh, you are not a predator of the spider or the ant or whatever you stepped on. Um, you are not a predator of that, that insect. However, if you go out every single day and you kill a squirrel and you eat the squirrel, then you are a predator of the squirrel and the squirrel is your prey. Um, predation may involve two animal species, but it can also involve an animal or insect consuming part of a plant, and that is called herbivory, or when uh, a plant eating uh, interaction occurs. So uh, yes, herbivores can be predators, and so that's a very distinct thing I want to point out is that herbivory is a special case of predation where one organism is eating either the plant body or the seeds or the fruit of another plant, okay? And so let's move on uh, to a picture here of our red fox taking down some sort of uh, mammal here. I'm not quite sure what that is, but this is the predator, this is the prey, okay? Now, when this organism was alive at one point, I'm not sure what it is, maybe it's a groundhog, a squirrel, not sure. Uh, but when this organism was alive, it was likely a predator of some other type of organism. And so just because you're a, a predator uh, at, in one interaction doesn't mean you can't be the prey in another interaction. Okay, If a wolf was to catch this guy or a coyote was to catch this guy, he would become the prey um, and the predator would be the predator. So just one type of example of, of predation, but we'll see more on Friday. Um, before I keep going, I'd like to define what the word symbiosis means. And symbiosis is a general term for an interspecific interaction in which two species live together in what is called a long-term intimate association. And so maybe before we've we've talked about symbiosis as something that is um, sort of jiving well, or we're doing well, we're in a nice symbiosis here in our office, or something like that. But in ecological terms. Symbiosis is a broad concept that includes relationships that have a variety of positive or negative effects on the participants. And so previously we talked about interactions that aren't about closely living things. And now we're going to talk about interactions that require the organisms to live within close association. And so the first I want to talk about is mutualism. In a mutualism, two species have a long-term interaction that is beneficial to both of them. So we call this a plus plus interaction. One example is some types of fungi form mutualistic associations with plant roots. We call these mycorrhizae. Um, the plants photosynthesize and that provides the fungus with sugar, um, which fixed carbon, which is in the form of sugar and or other organic molecules. But the fungus has this network of thread-like structures called hyphae, and we've seen that before when we talked about fungi. Um, and it allows the plant to capture water and nutrients from the soil um, well, and it provides them to the plant. And so the fungus gets uh, carbon, uh, sugar, from the photosynthesis that the plant does, and the plant gets water and nutrients from the soil that the fungus can catch. And so this is a plus-plus interaction. One other example of a mutualism is when an organism that is feeding on the nectar that is provided from this flower 
this flower also gets um, uh, fertilized. And so uh, when this uh, organism's beak goes down into this plant, a little bit of the pollen rubs off on it. And when it visits another plant, the pollen rubs off on that plant and that fertilization occurs. Now this uh, hummingbird gets the food that it desires and this plant gets fertilized. And so this is a plus for the bird and a plus for the plant. And so that is a mutualism. Okay, the next one I want to talk about is parasitism. And you've probably all heard of parasites before, but in a parasitism interaction, two species have a close lasting interaction that is beneficial to one, which is the parasite, and harmful to the other, which we call the host. So this is a plus minus interaction. Um, we know that some parasites cause familiar human diseases. For example, if you had a tapeworm living in your intestines, you're the host and the tapeworm is the parasite. And your presence enhances the tapeworm's quality of life, but not vice versa. Okay. Um, and so a parasite will live within your gut, it will feed upon the nutrition that you put in your body, and so you will be eating, but you'll be starving at the same time. And so that's a really bad combination. Um, another example here is a tick. Um, this is an ectoparasite, so a, a tapeworm would be an endoparasite living within you. A tick is an ectoparasite. They live on the outside of their host. They drink the blood. Uh, they'll stick on you, drink the blood, um, and they'll get all puffy. I'm sure you've seen or at least had the interaction with ticks before. Um, and it's kind of gross and kind of horrible, and they are also vectors for diseases. Um, but they do not kill you. So um, the the act of the of the tick drinking blood does not kill you, and so that's a major distinction between parasitism and what I want to talk about next, which is parasitoidism. Um, a parasitoid is an organism that lives in cl close association with its host at the host's expense, and it results in the death of the host. And so this is very different. Um, what happens is a parasitoid lays its eggs on the host and the larvae then feed on the host, which kills it as they develop. And so, um, yeah, pretty, pretty gross and horrifying. And we see this a lot with parasitoid wasps, where the wasp will come down, lay its egg on some sort of other host, and the egg will develop and grow into a wasp and use the host's body as a food source. And so when the developing larvae is ready to leave, this uh, host will be dead. And so that's different than parasitism. One other example of parasitism are uh, are the mosquitoes. Uh, sorry, I lost the word there for a second. The mosquitoes um, that we are all getting bit by during the summer. Now, you know that uh, getting bit by a mosquito doesn't kill you, but they do suck blood from you. And so that's a classic case of parasitism. And uh, you might say, well, what about malaria? And that you'd be right. Malaria can kill you. However, that is a disease that is carried by the mosquitoes and not the mosquitoes itself killing you. And so we call that parasitism. And when you do die as a result exactly of the organism that first uh, became a parasite of you, that is called parasitoidism. Okay. So the last one I want to talk about is something called commensalism. And I've talked about this briefly before, um, but I want to just bring it up again. So in theory, a commensalism is two species that have a long-term interaction that is beneficial to one and has either no positive or no negative effect on the other. We call it a plus zero interaction. So for instance, some scientists will say that many of the bacteria that inhibit our bodies seem to have a commensal relationship with us. They they benefit, they get shelter, nutrients, and they don't really obviously be uh, are helpful or harmful uh, on us. Now, it's worth noting that many apparent commensalisms actually turn out to be slightly mutualistic, so slightly beneficial to both, or slightly parasitic, and so that would mean positive, negative, uh, when we look at them more closely. And so, in my opinion, and an opinion of a lot of other scientists, commensalisms do not exist. Um, it's just maybe that the interaction that we're looking at, we haven't looked at in a close enough vein of thought, okay? Um, and I'll provide more examples of things that we previously thought were commensalistic, 
um, and now we know are either mutualistic or in fact parasitic. Um, and so this is where I want to stop for today. The next time you see me, we will go over uh, the Friday lecture. And Friday's lecture will be tied with the lab activity for this week, which will just be um, answering a number of questions based on the Friday lecture. And so I look forward to doing that on Friday. I think you will enjoy it a lot. Please email me or get in contact with me um, on our uh, group chat. We have a group chat now going. There's uh, about 10 people in there. And it's just somewhere where you can sort of get instant access to me if you need it. Um, if you don't want to wait for me to answer your email. So I look forward to seeing you next time and uh, have a good day.